Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have once again that we can come before you and look at this important subject. We're praying, O oh Lord, that you speak to our hearts. As we have used these children to speak to us and touch our lives, we pray that your anointing will never leave these children in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, as you have started using them in their youth, that you will continue to use them until the Lord comes in Jesus' name. We also pray that those of us who are parents will have more love for our children, give more time to our children, and see how we can train our children to be a challenge in the church of the living God. We pray, O oh Lord, that these children will not only be singers, they'll be soul winners. They'll be evangelists and teachers and pastors. And your hand will be upon them. And you will continue with them. That Lord, when eventually we get to heaven, these children will have crowns on their heads. And there will be many stars in their crowns as well in Jesus' name. Bless them. Bless us. And use us and them to bless the world. In Jesus' name, we pray. The message we have tonight is child training in the Christian family. But before I go to the message, you are going to allow me to speak to these children. Because child training is talking to parents in particular and talking to leaders, pastors in the church on how to train children and because these children are not parents, much of what I say may go over their shoulders. And so before I really get into the message of child training in the Christian family, I'm going to take some few minutes and talk to the children. The song you just sang is the song of the prodigal son of the prodigal daughter that told the father give me the portion that belongs to me and he went into a far country in his mind he had big dreams dreams of pleasure and dreams of enjoyment and dreams of fulfillment and dreams of liberty and dreams of good association he could picture in his mind that was going to the far country out of the restraint of father out of the instruction of mother out of the restriction in the home and he felt if he could have liberty he'll be able to do whatever he wanted he got to the far country and all the dreams he had in his mind of freedom, of liberty, of enjoyment, of pleasure, everything crumbled. He began to be want. Prodigal son, prodigal daughter, away from home, will always be in want. He looked at all the dreams he had in mind, beautiful dreams, ivory tower dreams, dreams of joy and pleasure and good association. And everything fell down to the ground. Then did he have these words that you children sang tonight, shattered dreams. 
shattered dreams. Nothing, at last, has turned out right. I thought, away from daddy, away from mommy, away from restriction, away from family devotion, away from obedience, away from parental authority, I felt everything would be all right. But this prodigal son and daughter realized nothing at last has turned out right. He tried to sleep at night. He couldn't sleep. He felt the guilt. He wondered, how will my father, how will my mother respond? Do I still have anything at home? Because I took everything belonging to me and I've wasted everything in riotous living. Once again, did the tears begin to come out of his eyes before he even gave expression to the crying. Shattered dreams again, he said. Shattered dreams. My life without Christ is all shattered dreams. Then he tried to recollect. How did I come to this situation? I decided to leave home and family. To leave everything behind and live all alone along the aisles where the birds are singing, where the field is green, where it appears I'll be able to have everything I wanted. I'll eat what I want. I'll drink what I want. I'll dress the way I want. There'll be no, uh, no jewelry, no permanent. All that will not be there. I will just be on those aisles, never thinking of the heart that I left behind, the heart of daddy, the heart of mommy, in search of the dreams within my mind. It didn't matter at that time when I was taking that decision, the children sang. When I left, it didn't matter whose heart was broken. Daddy cried, mommy cried, all the others said, don't go, church is good, Bible is good. It didn't matter to me. I didn't care how many tears were cried. I was determined within my heart to have my way now. This is my chance. No more church. No more Christianity. I've decided right now I'm going to try it and I'll make it. I wanted to see for a while the other side of life. Daddy only talks about gospel, about following the Lord, and we had no television in the house. I wanted to be free and go and see the other side of life. But I got to the other side. I wandered far away from God. But am I happy? No. Shattered dreams. I've wandered far away from God. But the child decided, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I have trod. Now I'm coming home. See. If I'd waited at home, Bible reading going on, family devotion going on, everything going on well, what many things I would have learned, but now I've wasted many precious years. And now I repent with bitter tears. I'm coming home, coming home, coming home. You know, if I get back home now, and father and mother will still receive me, open the Bible, get me into fellowship. Here is my promise, children, never more to roam. Never more to go out of home. Never more to seek the wild side of life. Now, Lord, open the arms of love because I'm coming home. I remember on the rugged cross of Calvary. That's why Jesus gave his life to make it possible 
for every child, every son, every daughter, to come to the Father. And though the vilest of sinners, any of them may be, as they have gone far away, the Lord will receive them. And as the Lord receives them, and I want to tell you leaders, these children, although you see some of them are like tiny thoughts, very, very small, they are all born again by the grace of God. We examine them, we interview them, we scrutinize them. Oh, there are others of the children that can sing, but some of them didn't pass the interview of being born again. And they interview them, what restitution did you make after you were born again? And those who could not give a very definite thing that they did, they, were, they are not here. But these ones, these are the people that have told the Lord, Thou art my everlasting portion. These are the children that have told the Lord in their young age, Close to thee, close to thee, all along my pilgrim journey. You know, we started late. Many of you were converted at the age of 25, at the age of 30, at the age of 35. Look at these children. There are some of them just eight years of age, like Josiah the king. There are some of them seven years of age, like Jehoash the king. There are some of them that are 16 years of age, like perhaps Azariah the king. The people that did right in the sight of the Lord. There are some of them so young, they may not even know their age. Jeremiah did not know his age. He just said, I am a child, O God. There are some of them just 12 years of age, as Jesus Christ was found in the temple, discussing with the elders and the rulers of the synagogue, asking them hard questions from the Bible. These children, by the grace of God, they have decided... They will follow the Lord till the end. And I believe it will be so. With our encouragement, with our prayers for them, with our love for them, I believe they will stand true till the end. It's very simple. The Lord will not allow any temptation that is above the temptation a child can bear. With the little, little temptations that come at school, come with their playmates, and come in the home, some of them that do not have their parents in the church. With the little, little temptations that come, God will always make a way for them that they will escape and they will serve the Lord. I don't have time tonight, children, I would have told you. Testimonies of people, of those that got converted at the age of four, at the age of five, I would have told you, children that began uh, preaching, there is a child, I think he's still alive, he will be in his sixties now. He's called Little David. He started preaching at the age of nine, and he's still alive. And this little David, at the age of nine, he'll mount the platform like this, very small child. I saw his picture myself. And he will preach, and the adults will be there. And the oaks and the mighty trees, I'm talking of men, the oaks and the mighty trees will be swayed by the wind of the Spirit. By the time little David finishes preaching, those oaks are falling down, bowing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these children, although what they have done here is only to sing, it's now, they are now going to be going to the next step, which is preaching the gospel. We are going to rise up and we pray for these children. That the Lord himself will keep the anointing on them. That the Lord himself will keep the power on them. That the Lord himself will keep them in consecration. That the Lord will not leave them alone. That the Lord will forever be with them. As they have been a challenge to us. That the Lord will continue to make them bright shining light. And a challenge. And a challenge. When they are sick that the Lord will heal them. When they are oppressed that the Lord will deliver them. When they are sorrowful that the Lord will give them joy. When they have any temptation, that the Lord will give them victory. When they have any need in their families, that God will provide for them. When their parents cannot provide school fees for them, that provision will come from on high. And the provision will be in the lives of these children. That they will never wander away. That they will never go away from the Lord. 
that they will serve the Lord. They will serve the Lord. They will continue serving the Lord. They will never, never, never leave the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for a church like this where children can know the Lord, their fathers can know the Lord, and their mothers can know the Lord. We thank you, Lord, because we have felt your touch in the lives of these children and through the lives of these children. And we pray, O Lord, what you have begun with them and with us. You'll continue until we see you face to face in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for children here whose parents are not in the church. We pray that you will touch their parents. We pray that you will bring them into the gospel. And we pray, O oh Lord, that these children, their lives will be like a big magnet that will attract daddy and mommy, senior brothers, senior sisters, and junior ones into the gospel in Jesus' name. And I pray that these children will not have any lack. That we, who are elders, leaders in the church, will be like fathers unto them, will be like mothers unto them, and Lord, whatever may be their physical needs, if their parents are not able to meet those needs, may you, O Lord, use every one of us so that these children will know that you are a God who cares, who has put them in a church that cares as well. Be with us, Lord, for the rest of the night. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There, the scripture tells us we need to train up our children in the way those children ought to go. And the Lord assures us that if we are faithful in training our children, not only teaching them, not only instructing them, training them, training goes beyond simple instruction or mere teaching. If we train them in the way of the Lord, the way we should train them, the Lord has given us the promise that when they become old, they will not depart from what we teach or train them for. The purpose of child training is to prepare our children for the future. The future responsible, the future of responsible adult life, that's one kind of future. And then the eternal future after the earthly pilgrimage, that's the other future. When we train our children, we're preparing them for a future on earth and a future beyond the world. The challenges of future years will be greater than those of today. New sets of problems will come up by the time these children and all our children get to adulthood. Opportunities will arise by the time they get into adulthood, the kind of opportunities that were not there today. In the technological world, things will change. In another 15, 20 years, almost every child at school will be forced to use a computer. Who knows, in the future years, 15, 20 years from now, Petrol that we're using for vehicle may not be the common thing. It may be another kind of thing that will be used for the vehicle. Who knows the use of hydrogen 
and the use of chemical things that by the time you get into the future, 15, 20 years from now, there will be purer air, purer atmosphere than we have today. And who knows the discovery of the planets, the discovery of the various orbits, who knows the scientific uh, advancement by the time these children have grown to such an age as we are now. And it is only as we prepare them well and train them well, equip them that they will be able to cope with the life that is to come. Our training must develop two things in our children. Number one, responsibility. Number two, creativity. Put it this way. Our training is to develop roots of responsibility and wings of creativity. That is to make your children to understand the root on which they are grounded is responsibility. But then they have to have the wings of creativity to be able to fly, to be able to discover, to be able to do things that we, their parents, were not able to do. You see, we are in control today. But our children will be in control tomorrow. The most important life in history are the lives of your own children. The most important lives in history are the lives of your own children. Therefore, we must make deliberate effort to have godly influence and impute in our children's lives. Children who are not well trained may end up in the wrong place later in life and much later in the hereafter. The children that are not well trained eventually are going to end up in the wrong place here on earth and also in the hereafter untrained, unequipped, uninstructed children. They are going to end up in the wrong place. Of course, you should know this, that child training takes time. It takes planning. It takes sacrifice. It takes self-discipline. Without planning to train our children, we seem never to have the time to do it. A thousand less important things steal our time and rob us of the great duty of training children. You see, to change the harsh terrifying atmosphere at home to a happy, supportive environment for nurturing our children will require grace and this will be rewarded in time, in life, and in eternity. How we train our children will bring about six things. Number one, how we train our children will determine how they live. The way you train your children will show how they live, will determine how they live. Number two, it will determine what time they get saved. If you give time to your children, you interact with your children, you love your children, you instruct your children, you train your children, it's going to determine the time they get saved. Number three, it will determine how they make friends wisely. Training children will show those children that not every person in their peer group can be friend. It will show them how to choose friends, make friends wisely. Number four, it will show them how to trust other people and who to trust and what level of trust our children should have in different kinds and categories of people. Number five, training our children will make them to expect the best out of life. They know that God created them and we tell them that our God never created failure. That in the mind of God, the picture he has for our children is the picture of happiness, 
the picture of righteousness, the picture of being a real, fulfilled, satisfied, developed child of God. And when you train your children, it will make them to expect the best out of life. They will not be children that are standing at the back of every queue. They will be the people that depend not on IQ, but they depend on I can. You see, there are people that have great, marvelous, intelligence quotients, IQ. But then they do not have, they are not trained to understand that the IQ they have could work for them. But your child may not have a very high IQ. But then he may have in the Lord, because of the training, he may have the confidence and the trust and the faith, and he says, I can, I can. He says, I can do that, I can read, I can study, I can make good grades, I can befriend people, I can lead others, I can do that. He doesn't depend on just IQ, but I can. And it is the training that you give to your children that will make them to have that kind of perspective in life. Number six, training children will make the children see problems as opportunities, regardless of their looks and handicaps. You see, some children have handicaps. Some children have a different look, you know that, from other children. But when you train your children very well, those children, they understand that what, where they get to in life, what they do in life, and what they get in the kingdom of God doesn't depend upon their look, doesn't depend upon their handicap. It depends on the great faith they have in the Lord. What if we don't train our children? What will be the consequence of not training our children? Neglected, untrained children cause six things. Or they become six things. There's no time, not enough time to read all the scriptures. Just write them down. Number one, they become grief to their parents. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. Untrained children, neglected children become griefs to their parents. Number two, they become rebels, fools, misfits in life. Children that are not well trained. Eventually, they're going to become rebels, fools, misfits in life. Proverbs 15.5. Number three, they become the source of sorrow and heartache to their parents. If we neglect our children and we're so busy in many other things and we neglect the important training of our children, those children are eventually going to become the source of sorrow and heartache to us, the parents. Number four, that's Proverbs 17, 21. Number four, they will become the cause of calamity, disaster, and disappointment for the parents. If those children are neglected and they are not trained, those children become the cause of calamity, disaster, and disappointment for the parents. Proverbs 19, 13. Number five. They will become lifetime shame and disgrace for the parents. Lifetime shame and disgrace for the parents. Proverbs 19, 26. Number six, these neglected, untrained children will become vagabonds, robbers in society, scourge and punishment for their negligent parents. If we don't train our children, they're going to become vagabonds eventually. They're going to become robbers. They'll start stealing at home. Then they go to stealing in the neighborhood. Then the teachers will bring report that they stole at school. And eventually when they grow into life, 
the steel in society and it will become scourge and punishment for their negligent parents. Proverbs 28 verse 24. The great number of preaching ministering parents who neglected the training of their children to their own shame, to their own sorrow, to their own suffering, stands as a great warning to all of us. We all know the unfortunate examples of Eli, of Samuel, and of David. They neglected the training of their children. Eli was a high priest. Samuel, a prophet. David, a king. High priest, prophet, king. Those three important responsibilities and offices in Israel that these people occupied the responsibilities and the tasks was so demanding that they neglected the training of their children they suffered for it and Israel suffered for it too we must not be so busy in ministerial duty that we have no time to train our children. Our future happiness depends upon the training of our children to a large extent. If you want to be happy later, discipline yourself to carry out the duty of training the children now. I don't know how much time will permit me to share with you but assuming time will permit, there should be three points. Number one, guide posts in child training. Number one, guide posts in child training. Number two, love and discipline in child training. Love and discipline in child training. Number three, power of example in child training. The power of example in child training. Let's uh, look at Proverbs 22 verse 6 again. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. You are to give special attention to each child because each child is unique. You train up each child in the way he should go. When he becomes old, he will not forget the personal attention you gave to him or to her, and he will not depart from each. And this is the responsibility of both father and mother. Father cannot do it all. Mother cannot do it all. Training of a single child and the training of all the children is the joint responsibility of both father and mother. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. The father is involved. And forsake not the law of thy mother. The mother is also involved. The father cannot say, I am just the breadwinner. All I can do is to go and earn money so as to provide for the children and for the whole family. He must make sure that he has time to also instruct and teach and train the children. And the mother cannot say, I've got to keep a job too. Because what the father earns is not enough. I've got a lot of responsibilities. And therefore, I do not have time to train the children. Both father 
and mother should get involved in child training. And you know, the average deeper life pastor is so very busy that perhaps the only thing he knows of his children is the name of each child. He might even forget the age, forget the need, forget the books that the child will have to take to school, forget the pains, the trauma, the difficulty, the unanswered questions that these children have because the average deeper life pastor has so much to do and has a wide field to evangelize that in the morning he, he wants to study the Bible so much on his own, not with the wife and of course not with the children because the children are too low in understanding that all he wants is to get into concordance and the Greek and the Hebrew and Dick's annotated reference Bible and Thompson's chain reference Bible and Bible dictionary and he digs and digs and digs while he's digging his children are perishing. The average woman in deeper life is also very busy with ministerial activity because the average mother in deeper life is saying, God is not going to reward me for what my husband is doing. He is evangelizing, I must evangelize. He is winning souls, I must win souls. He is counseling, I must counsel. He is a leader, I must be a leader. The Lord is not going to reward me for what my husband is doing. Therefore, the mother also in deeper life has no time for these little children. The mother is out for business. When, he, when she comes back, she might be a woman representative or she might be a particular kind of leader in deeper life in the local church. And therefore, she doesn't even have time to prepare good meals for the children. And even at little age, mother will just say, you know where your food is. I have consecrated to the Lord that children are not going to hinder me from the work of the kingdom. Before you children were born, I gave my life to the Lord. And I want to go and save the lost outside when the lost inside do not have the gospel. Charity begins at home. You want to preach? Start at home. You want to pray? Start at home. You want to counsel? Start at home. You want to instruct other people? Start at home. It is the responsibility of both the father and the mother. Look at it again in verse 8 of Proverbs chapter 1. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. In Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 1. Hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. You see, both the father and the mother are referred to as having very strong transforming influence in the life of the children in verse 4 he taught me also and said unto me let thine heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live verse 10 and verse 11 here O my son and receive my sayings and the years of thy life shall be many i have taught thee in the way of wisdom I have led thee in the right paths. We ought to teach our children. We ought to direct our children. We ought to guide our children. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, this verse talks about our Lord, but when he was a child. And it shows us the four areas where we need to train our children, develop, bring up our children. Verse 52 of Luke chapter 2. 
and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Four areas there. Number one, wisdom. Talking about the mental aspect of the child. Number two, stature. Talking about the physical need of the child. Number three, favor with God. Talking about spiritual area or aspect of the life of the child. Number four, favor with man. The social aspect of every child's life. Four parts. Mental, physical, spiritual, social. The four legs of a table are important to its stability and usefulness. If one leg is missing, the table loses balance and becomes unstable. These four areas are so important for the balanced development in every child. And if one area is missing, there are some parents that will only concentrate on the spiritual, a little on the physical, maybe a little on the mental, but they do not have anything to do on the social aspect, the interaction of the child with other children and with adults as well, having favor with men. They don't concentrate on that aspect. And you will discover that if that leg is missing, the child develops an imbalanced, unstable life. Let's take note of some seven things in the guide posts. As we train our children, what are the seven things that are so very important in the training of the children? Number one, acceptance and appreciation. Some of our people feel that training children is simply commanding them and spanking them. Don't do this. If you do it, I strike you. That's all they know about training. But that's not how to train. Number one is to show that child you appreciate the child. You accept the child. In Genesis chapter 48, verse 9. Genesis chapter 48, verse 9. And Joseph said unto his father, They, they are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee unto me, and I will bless them. Joseph appreciated those children, and he referred to them in such a wonderful way. He said, daddy, these are the children that the Lord has given me in this place. You can tell a parent talking like that, a parent having that attitude to the children will be able to bring up those children in the way of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Here Isaiah said, my children are not an accident. If you have the concept that that child came accidentally, you're not going to accept the child. If you have the concept that before you knew the Lord, you went into relationship with the woman and she became pregnant and that pregnancy forced you into the marriage when the child is born you will always have the concept that i didn't prepare for it i didn't want it what happened forced me into taking the mother as a wife if that is the attitude there is no way in which you can train those children in the appropriate way you have to understand the child is not an accident let each child 
have a sense of belonging in the family. Let a child feel that he is loved and accepted and appreciated in the family. If you are going to do that, if you have more than one child, avoid comparisons between your children. Don't say, this is good, that is bad. Avoid comparisons. If you're always making comparison, you are destroying the child that you are saying you are not as good as the other children. You're not as good as the other children. Or the father saying, you are not like me. I don't know where you came from. Or the mother saying, you are not like me. I don't know where you came from. Don't you see me, how I do this, how I do that? What kind of child are you? Give that child a sense of belonging. That you are happy to be the father of that child. You are happy to be the mother of that child. Once in a while, call the child, put your arms around the child, and say, child, you know, I'm so happy that you are my child. I just love you, I appreciate you. And I don't think I, I can have any other child that I can love more than you. And do that to the other child too. And do that to the other child too. Let each child know that I am unique, I am special before my father, before my mother. Never, never give the impression that this is an unwanted child. Do everything you can. If you have given that impression in the past, do everything you can to wipe up and erase that attitude and that concept in the heart of each child. Number two provision of basic needs provision of basic needs in first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 just write that down make sure you provide food provide love provide care provide attention especially when a child is sick give more attention when a child is tired, weary, worn out, give more attention. When a child is preparing for examination at school, give more attention. You are a father and you know mathematics, you know technical drawing, and you know chemistry, you know physics, or you are a mother, you know home economics, or you know geography, or you know history, Give attention to the child while the child is preparing for exam and offer to teach the child, not with cane, but with love. You know, once in a while, when father wants to have time, maybe after hearing a message like this, train a child, train a child, and he goes back home and he says, I will train you. And then uh, the child is preparing for exam. And he says, where are your books? Bring them here. And then, go and bring the cane and put it here. If I say it once, you don't get it, the cane is there. You're not giving attention then. You don't really have time for that child. You don't love that child. Let there be love. And give attention. And when a child has failed, that child is bleeding on the inside. That child is suffering on the inside. That is the time you give extra attention. You point out what caused the failure. Is it carelessness? Is it being too playful? Is it that he procrastinated? He delayed in reading? Is it that he assumed he was overconfident? You explain that to him. But then, what is gone is gone. Begin to have the love therapy and begin to put in love and put in reassurance and build up his confidence again that that single failure doesn't mean you are a failure in life it's just to teach you a lesson that if you don't read your brain is good i'm your daddy and normally i should tell you that you take after me and your mommy mommy is well educated although mommy may not have big certificate but you know mommy is intelligent and daddy is intelligent, and you share from the brain, you share from the look of daddy and mommy, you also share from the brain of daddy and mommy, you can make it, and you will make it. That failure is just to tell you that although you are a good child, although you are brilliant, if you do not read, 
you will not remember what you don't read. Now, let's sit down. Let's begin to do the work. Let's begin to prepare for the next semester of the next quarter or term. That is the way to give attention to the child. Also give space to the child. You see, it is part of provision for the child. When the child has, if possible, a bed of his own, in a particular corner of his own, and you don't intrude into that place, you don't, when a visitor comes, you don't say, there is no mattress for the visitor, and take the mattress of the child. Let that be his property. And he knows that he is given the respect and is given the understanding that this belongs to him. If you have to find something for the visitor, you'll rather take your own or take mommy's own, and then you will share with mommy and then give to the visitor. Make sure that the child understands that he is important in the family and is giving attention in the family and giving books, not only academic books, there are some story books, Christian stories. There are books with drawings that they can page. And then let there be adequate clothing and inculcate in that child that he must always be neat. And when he comes back home and he, he removes his dress, always inculcate in him that clothes should not be there. Go and hang it up. Don't do it for him. Teach him responsibility. Root of responsibility, wings of creativity. And then when he, you know, the toilet and all that, there'll be a even if the child is not too uh, much old and he cannot do a lot of things, let him follow mommy to the place and see this is how we clean this, this is how we clean this, bring that one and bring that one. And then later, the child will be doing that himself. Let the child have the dignity of labor, that the child will know that it is dignifying to work with your hand. And of course, if the child is very young, give him toys not a useless toys that are very costly but are not teaching anything educative useful instructive toys when you can get them number three there should be balanced protection and exposure you see we expose our children we also protect our children if you over protect the child the child is spoiled if you overexpose the child, the child gets into danger that he cannot handle. Therefore, let there be a balanced protection and exposure for the children. In Psalm 144, Psalm 144, from verse 7 and verse 8, send thine hand from above. Read me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children. Don't bring strange children into your family. Children with familiar spirit. Children with witchcraft. Children that are already smoking Indian hemp or marijuana. Or children that are already addicted to drugs. Or children that already know the way of immorality, homosexuality, and prostitution. Do not bring those children to mix with your own children. So that you will be protecting your children. Read me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children. Whose mouth speaketh vanity. And their, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Watch the children that your children are moving with. If those children are liars, if they fight, and they are quarrelsome, and they are blasphemous in their language, and they are ruffians, warn your children, and shield your children from children that will destroy them or corrupt them, because evil communication corrupts good manners. In verse 11, read me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouths speaketh vanity and the right hand is the right hand of falsehood that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth and that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace number four let there be the centrality of god and his word in the family 
the centrality of God and his word in the family. If you read on your own later, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. The children were to see the law of God written all over the house in their parents' absence. The word of God was to be at the doorpost. They were to speak about the word when they were sitting down. They were to speak about the word when they were lying down. And when they were walking on the road. It was to reflect even on their dressing. It was to reflect in their profession, in their farming. The children were to see the word of God symbolized in everything their parents did. What their parents said. What their parents wore. And the work the parents were doing. They were to hear it whenever the parents opened their mouths. Whenever you open your mouth to your children, let it be something that has relationship with the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that you're always quoting the Bible to your children, but it means that the overall evaluation of what you say, what you do with the children, we have its root, its basis in the Word of God. Number five, Fellowship with the children. Fellowship with the children. There should be parental involvement in the spiritual activities of the children. Parental involvement in the educational activities of the children. And in the physical activities of the children. There are times that your children will be playing with toys. And something has gone wrong in that toy. The child should not be afraid to bring the toy to you. You should be able to sit down if the child is sitting on the ground or sitting on the chair. Sit down with the child wherever he's sitting down. And then fix that thing. And say, this is the way it works. That is the way it works. And let that child feel that daddy and myself are the same. That we can sit down on the ground together. We can talk the same language together and we can even play with this toy together. Or if the child has a Lego and is building a chair or building a house with a Lego and he says, Daddy, you can't do this. See what I've done. You sit down there and say, you child, watch me. I can do it better than you can do it. And then you construct something. Oh, Daddy can do this thing too. Let the child feel that there is a fellowship. There is an interaction between you and him. Not that any time daddy comes home, the children go to hide because trouble has come. Daddy and trouble. Daddy and complaint. Mommy and nagging. Mommy and complaint. Let there be love. Let there be involvement in the home. And always make sure that every time you are spending quality time. Now quality time may just be 10 minutes. But wonderful time that to share with the child. It may be that we just share a scripture. It may be that to share something that is just pleasant. It may be that to share the sorrow of that child. It may be that you find out what is troubling the child. It may be that the child has a particular disappointment and you are finding out what is it. And the child, because of the involvement, because of the interaction, is never afraid to tell you what, even when the child has made a mistake. The child can run to you and say, Mommy, see what I've done. Daddy, see what I've done. Not that you'll be waiting until you question the child and question the child. It is because there's no fellowship and interaction. Let there be fellowship with the children. Parental involvement in the spiritual, educational, physical activities of the children. Spending time together and doing things together. Not giving enough time to a child not giving enough attention to a child is devastating to the child it is so important that you pray with your children not long prayer simple prayer they pray you pray read with your children read the bible with your children not long long chapters read a chapter together and say child you say what you have gained in this chapter. Another child, say what you have gained. Mother, say what you have gained. And daddy, say what you have gained. And they all share what they have gained. And after that, you pray together. 
so that as you pray together, the child prays, every child prays, mommy prays, daddy prays as well. That is fellowship. Do that in the morning. Do that in the evening. So that there will be that interaction and love and bond between you. You should also know that you should know your children's friends. Ask your children. Oh, that book I saw in your hand, that's not yours. Who has that? Oh, his name is uh, such and such. Who is that person? Ah, it's my friend. Are you older than him? Is he older than you are? No, we are just age mates. How do you know that you're age mates? How about the parents? Is he Christian? Is he Muslim? What brought you together to start with? What do you like in him? Why does he like you when he knows that you are a Christian? And when he knows that you are going to a church like this, why does he like you? And then he will say, have you ever invited him to church? Would he come next Sunday? Know the friends of your children. And also, know the people that have strong influence in their lives. Let mommy or daddy follow them to school and see the teacher that is having strong influence in the life of that child. And see the people and the places where those children are going so that the children will know that you are interested in every aspect of their lives. Number six, instruction, assignment, supervision, correction, and encouragement. When we say we are training our children, it means that we give them instruction. Well, after you have given them instruction, then you follow up by an assignment. I'm not just talking of academic work. Take that daughter to the kitchen. The child, being a daughter, ought to know very early how to put something on the stove ought to know how to be able to light the stove and how to be able to boil water. Just let that child watch you and give simple, simple instruction. After you have given instruction, how do you know that a child has understood the instruction? Give assignment. And it may be a very simple assignment. Today, you are the one going to light the stove. Or today, you are the one that is going to wash that pot and put water inside, and then I will do the rest. Or today, you are the one going to uh, describe all the recipe for the soup we're going to cook. And if the soup today is delicious, I'm going to tell daddy that you are the one that prepared it. And what do we put first? And the, uh, your daughter says, uh, instead of water or whatever, I've forgotten it myself. It's a long time I got to the kitchen. But whatever it is, if the child says, uh, you know, put water, you put water. If the child says, uh, put something, you put it. But then, uh, if the child says, uh, you have to pour this one, and then it, be, it brings uh, a bottle of uh, sugar, because it's wine. And instead of pouring salt, don't pour that one now. Uh, tell the child, you know, that is, uh, you have assignment, you have supervision, then you have correction. You give assignment to the child. You supervise the child when he's doing it. You correct the child. And then you encourage the child. And then when you're on the table, as you say, Grace, we are going to eat together. You say, Daddy, you'll be surprised when you taste that food. I won't talk yet. Taste it first. And our, our daughter will tell you what happened today. And the daughter is all over smiling and happy. I cooked the first meal in my life today. And daddy, and if daddy understands the training of children, and daddy knows what mommy is striking at, that is, when, they, when daddy tastes that thing, although the thing is not really good enough and it's not very sweet and palatable, the daddy is not going to screw his face if daddy understands the rule of the game. Daddy is going to, after daddy has tasted, he will say, who prepared this? I must have an extra share of this. That child will be happy. That child is encouraged. That child feels that he, she can do something. And she will try to do it better. You see, we give assignment to children. We supervise them. We correct them. We encourage them. That's what the Bible means when it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. 
children need feedback on their performances from time to time. Number seven, assistance and support in development. Isaiah chapter 40, just write it down, no time to read. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Assist your children. Support your children. Why those children are growing up. And of course, you know, even after our children are saved, because of their young age, because of their inability to do some things, they will make some mistakes. Some of those mistakes may be costly. Sometimes it is that there is an accident at home because a child climbed a table and he was at the edge of the table and the table tipped and then he hurt himself and then he has to be treated. Sometimes it's using the swing at school and the hand is broken or the leg is broken. Or sometimes it is uh, one child wanting to get into the swing. He trying to get into the swing. And without wanting to do that, he pushed off the other child unknowingly. And the other child knocked the head on a stone. And it's bleeding. And he come to you at home saying, look what your child has done. And the child is a born again child. And this is not a wicked act. It is an accident. We daddies and mommies, we have accidents. There are times that some of our good mothers here put something on the fire, on the stove, and then they go to wash clothes, and they forgot there was something on the stove. Don't raise up your hand if that is you. And then, before we know what is happening, and if the whole thing is burning, our beloved sister, though sanctified, the nose is not sanctified, she cannot smell anything. And the whole thing is burning. Already smoke is coming up. Before we know what is happening. Ah, I forgot. Our mother is saved. But she forgot. And she almost burned out the whole house. If it can happen to mother, it can happen to children. And so you have to forgive those children of all the heartaches and the griefs they cause you. And the turmoil they bring into your life. And love them all the same. And be considerate for those children. Well, those are guideposts in child training. Number two, quickly, love and discipline in child training. Love and discipline in child training. Please note, it is not the other way around. It is not discipline and love. Love first. Love first. If you don't love your child and you discipline your child, you are going to destroy that child. Love first. Love him before you discipline him. Love him while you are disciplining him. Love him after you have disciplined him. And let him know in the tone of your voice, in the look on your face, in the rebuke that you are giving. Let him know that you love him. How does a child know? Oh, a child can know. You call the child. You said, you know how much I appreciate you. And you know how much I really, I want to have all my hope in you. And I put everything in you. And uh, because I love you, look at what you have done. And the Bible tells me that I have to correct you in this thing. And this is the correction I'm giving you. Don't do it again. It may be you want to beat him. It may be you want to deny him of a privilege, an opportunity. But do it in love. Of course, the punishment will be painful. The child may cry. Don't be sentimental about that. You love him, but let him bear that discipline. But don't let there be animosity and grudge and not greeting one another because of discipline. After that has been done, if you are supposed to eat together, you call him, say, my boy, come. And you know, it's still all tears and all that. And you say, my boy, come. It's time to eat. Sit on the table. Well, forget about that. I just corrected you that you shouldn't do that thing. Because if I didn't correct you, who else will tell you? I love you so much I have to tell you. Sit down and let us eat here. Or you like to sit on my own chair today. Let's exchange today. You sit on my chair. I sit on your chair. And then you wipe away all the tension among you. And then the child is now happy 
but he will not forget the discipline. If he does anything wrong, you are still going to discipline him, but it is discipline that is based on love. The same thing with the mother. Don't be in a hurry to discipline the child. Don't discipline the child if you are angry. You shouldn't be angry. He's a child. He's not an adult. He will make mistakes. He will do things that are wrong. Love him. Appreciate him. Don't ridicule him. Don't abuse him. Don't say, look at your face. Look at your teeth. Look at this one. Look at this one. Don't abuse him. Don't insult him because of a particular handicap. Never, never do that. Condemn wrong action. But don't condemn the child. The child is alright. The child is your child. The child wants to follow the Lord. The child is a candidate for heaven. Love the child, but condemn the wrong act. Let your child know that you make a difference between the action and the personality. Let your child know that you are reacting against an event, not against the child. You are reacting against a behavior, not against the child. You love the child, but you condemn the action that is wrong. That's how to discipline children in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. We need to love our children. Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Never make your children angry. Study your children. You see those children? They'll be different. If you have three, if you have four, if you have five, they'll be different one from the other. You know some of your children? Cain will not matter to them. If they do anything and you cane them four strokes, they'll just stretch out their hand like this, take all the four, and then rub their hand together and go his way. Study the child. If you know that that thing does not affect the child, find another method that will affect the child. And so, when you study your children, you will not provoke the children. You know that there are some things you will say that a child will just be all tears all through the day. If it happens that maybe the nose or the facial appearance or the eyeballs or something is wrong, you never, never, never speak about that. Never, never, never on your children. Never say, eh, you can't do better than that. Look at his eyeball. Never. Watch that child whenever you say that. On the inside, he's really troubled. And he condemns himself. Why am I like this? Why are my eyeballs like that? Why is my tooth like that? Why is this one like that? Never, never, never do that. So that you do not provoke the children. What you want to correct is action. You cannot, he cannot correct his nose. He cannot correct his facial appearance. He cannot correct his height if he's short. If he's uh, too tall or you think he's tall, he cannot correct that. What can he do about that? Don't talk about those things that he cannot correct. But the actions, the actions, the actions that are wrong, only that alone. It says, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Just write this now. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 6 to 11. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 6 to 11. Proverbs 29 verses 15 and 17. Let's look at Proverbs together, chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that speareth his rod, hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chastineth him betimes. That means that it's alright to beat your children. But 
Beat your children like you are beating a child, not like a soldier beating a soldier. You know, beating was a kind of punishment in the Roman government and the Jewish uh, system. And it could give 39 strokes of the cane. By the time they gave those 39 strokes, and those were strokes with sharp instruments in the whip, that they will put the lashes on that adult. By the time they do that, for some of those uh, people, they just paint and collapse. Don't beat your children like that. They're children. Don't go and buy a special cane that when you buy that thing, it's like a rod. And by the time you beat the fingers, you can break those bones. You can break the fingers. That's not your intention. You don't want to deform your child. And also, don't be in a hurry. You want to beat your child, and the child is putting the hand near to the face or near to the eyes. Don't be in a hurry to beat the child. Make sure that you do not hurt the eye of the child. And if you want to be the child at the buttocks, make sure that the child has clothes on. What's the purpose of saying the child should be totally naked? You don't want to destroy your child. You want to beat him. You want to correct him. You want it to pain him, but you don't want to destroy him. And you don't also make a rule in your house and say, ah, what's wrong in this house? I've not beaten these children today. What's wrong with me? And already it's uh, already five minutes to ten. And the children have not uh, taken any case today. And before they sleep tonight, I must find something. Because the Bible says, chastise them betimes. That's not discipline. That one will be wickedness. Therefore, let us, be, let us be very careful that as we train our children, we actually love them, we appreciate them, we're doing the right thing for them, and they will enjoy, they will know. They will know that you have to train them. They will know you have to beat them when it is necessary, only when it is necessary. It is not every offense that demands caning. Some of the offenses will just be, don't do that again. Some of the offenses will just say, is that right? Should you have done that? I expected more than that from you. Some of the offenses will be, you. I thought you knew that was wrong. How could you do that? And a child will be a little bit unhappy with himself. All right, don't do that again. Other offenses will be, that bicycle, you're not going to ride it anymore this whole week. That's discipline, not beating. But you don't punish your child with food. You don't say, okay, because of that water that poured on the ground, no lunch, no supper. That one is not discipline. That's another thing. So let's make sure that we have real discipline that is Bible-based. And both parents should agree as to what form of discipline we give to the children. If the mother is uh, spanking or correcting the child, uh, the father should not say, that's enough. You complain too much. How about you yourself? If I were to talk on everything that you do, uh, will, will, will we still be married together? <laughs> if you do that... How are you a Christian? Or if, uh, you know, daddy is trying to rebuke the children and mommy will run, ah, ah, stop, oh. Nine months of pregnancy is not a joke. I know what I went through. Don't kill him for me. <laughs> there will be disagreement on the children. And the children will know where to run to. If they know that mommy is always defending them, when daddy wants to talk, they run to mommy. If they know that it's always mommy that is correcting them, but uh, daddy is only reading Bible and uh, that's all he knows and singing Amazing Grace. Then they will always run to daddy whenever mommy is going to correct them. Let us both parents be agreed, united together as to the kind of discipline we give to the children. Let me just go to point three. Power of example in child training. The power of example in child training. Later on your own, you can read... Ezekiel chapter 16 and in verse 44. Now, as I close, as I said, I will not be able to actually say everything I intended to say because of time. But I thank God because 
is shown some few things to us together. Now, talking about example, example is very, very important. And we have been told that if children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with gossips, they learn to disrespect and belittle other people. If children learn, live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If children live with fairness, they learn justice. If children live with security, they learn to have faith. If children live with fear, they grow up standing at the end of every line. They are afraid to take their place in life. If children live with praise, they learn to appreciate and stand for what they know to be right. If children are spoiled with indulgence and permissiveness, they grow up full of compromise and greed. If children are given challenges and responsibilities, they grow up with values and goals. If children live with depression, they grow up looking for pills and shots to get them high. If children live with optimism, they grow up thinking they were born to fly. If children live with hate, they grow up blind to beauty and blind to true love. If children live with love, they learn to be kind and they learn to be unselfish. If children are reminded of all bad things in them that we see, they will become exactly what we hoped they'll never be. If children live with acceptance and friendship, they learn to find love around them anywhere they are. If we tell our children we're so happy to be their parents, they will grow up believing that God loves them and that he is on their side has placed them here on earth specially to fulfill a definite part of his global plan and will. Let your children live with love, with appreciation, with encouragement, with praise. 